It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Thanks, uh, BI, for sponsoring us. Uh, thanks, Dr. James, for, for all you have done to, get, to put this together. So today the idea is to give you uh, a brief update of what we're doing at the University of Minnesota. So I'm going to start with a very brief update on the Morrison Swining Monitoring Project, talking a little bit about PERS and PED, and then we're going to move on highlighting those important things that we have learned about PERS recently. And then I'm going to turn it on to Juan and to Carlos. We're going to show you a little bit of interesting data that we have been, uh, sorry, interesting results from the data that we have been collecting in the project so that we can end up and wrapping it up with what we're seeing as the next steps uh, from the university. So let's talk about, about the, the, prog the program update. <clears throat> the program continues. Even though uh, Bob, Bob's early departure hit us really hard, the program continues. Thanks again to, to your support. The team remains the same, so team integrity uh, remains. As you can see, my name is up there. So I have be, I've joined the program as a principal investigator. Andres Perez is the co-investigator. But then we have a long list of collaborators within the university and outside the university. So there you can see Dr. Troy Morel, Mohamed al Khamis, who's looking at uh, purse evolution. Then we have Kim Vanderwall, who's going to be helping, well, who has been helping us with uh, network analysis. Then we have Julio Alvarez, who has been looking at uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, data. And then we have collaborators from Iowa State uh, University or Ohio State University, such as Dr. Linares, Holcamp, and Aruda. Then we have a big team of people that are doing actually a lot of work on, on data analysis, who, who you will hear from, which is Carlos Juan, Paulo, the person that is doing all the engineering, the IT work. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work behind, all, behind this project. And Emily, who some of you might know, she's the one that is doing the data management. And then we have some students that are also doing their PhDs uh, using some of this data. So the project continues to grow. I'm sure some of you have seen this graph before. We continue to enroll systems. We continue to add more South Farms to the point that we have reached more or less 50% of the South Herd population in the U.S., which to me that's a pretty phenomenal number so that we can start drawing some conclusions. So today we stand where we have 30 systems, more or less 3 million sows, depending on what disease they're reporting to. Not everybody's reporting PERS but most of them are reporting PED. The interesting thing is that when we look at the number of farms, and this is related to PERS, number of sow farms from which we have data, there's quite a few that we have more than five years of data. So it's pretty much 500 sow farms from which we've got uh, PERS diagnostics data, and then we have 441 that less than five years. Still, that's a really good number. Again. This wouldn't be possible without the participants' willingness to provide the results, also the veterinarians, uh, practitioners that are willing to engage with this project. And as well, I think it's important to mention that uh, the Swine Health Information Center has been a very important partner uh, from a funding uh, standpoint, as well as other supporting agencies, as this USDA, ASB, and others that uh, play a role in the project. The project, the project has two goals. One, a long-term goal, as Bob used to say, which is we need to make sure that the industry is ready if there's a new emerging pathogen so that we can respond in a better way. He used the PED example in which not until half of the South herd became infected, we were able to stop it. Well, so that's our long-term goal. But then in the meantime, we're going to have some short-term goals. One of them, which you see on our weekly report, which is trying to monitor disease prevalence and incidence, right? We're also going to be helping, or we have been helping with uh, outbreak investigations. And also, we're all also starting to understand what the implications of uh, pig transports are in, on regions. So I've been talking with different participants, going around and uh, getting some feedback, which we're always open to feedback because at the end of the day, this project is the U.S. industry project. It's not the University of Minnesota. It's actually the U.S. Swan industry project. And we'll be getting some good feedback. And we continue to hear that the project continues to provide value. One of the important things is that a lot of, a lot of participants say it's really good to know if 
first this year is better or worse than last year. So that benchmark is really helpful for a lot of producers. We continue to hear that we feel that we've, we've been advancing. We're getting better at how to manage the disease and how to understand what's going on in the field. But also, there's a lot of producers that they just want to be part of this big project that has enormous potential. So they just want to contribute. They just want to be pretty transparent uh, sharing their data with us. So as you know, I guess all of you, the ones that have been getting uh, the, our reports, you can tell by the graph that first season has already started. So last night we got, this is not the, la the latest graph, but uh, last night you have, must have gotten the latest graph in which we see this very cyclical trend, right? So every fall we continue to see an increase in purse breaks. So when we zoom in into, that, uh, into the last few weeks, we can see that we have overpassed this threshold, right? But the interesting thing is that during the summer we saw a signal, which Juan is gonna talk a little bit, about, a little bit more about this signal for the run. So again, we continue to see the same trend as well. When we look at all the, at the database, and when we look at all the south farms from which we got a diagnosis or break history, so we have 936 farms from which we can say, well, 40% of them have never reported an outbreak. That means that they have been able to keep the virus out. But then the remaining, like 59%, 60% of them have had at least one break. In the, in the, in the, we can say, depending on when they join. Of course, you can see there that there's some farms that have had more than five breaks, more than six breaks. Maybe they have been in the project longer. But the interesting thing is that at least one break in 60% of those herds. Now, the other question we had is, how often does that happen? So if I, if I break today, when, what are the chances of me breaking within the next year? Well, we looked at 379 farms from which we would be able to calculate the kind of time in between breaks. And then we were able to see that if you break today, 58% of those hearts are gonna break again within one year. To me, that's kind of scary at some point in the sense that if we break today, we know that something's gonna happen within the next 12 months. Now, there's some other farms that have been very successful at keeping the virus up away for more than one year, so I guess that helps us from, uh, help them from an economic standpoint. Let's move on to PED. I guess PED, it's something that uh, the industry should be proud of from a control standpoint in the sense that once we saw the big outbreak in 2013, 2014 year, the industry was very good at controlling, and we can see that there's some areas where there's no outbreaks. However, when we look again at the data, and when we look at those farms that have, have had breaks in this year, again, the Morrison Swinehill monitoring project year, fiscal year, we can see that out of those 14 herds that have had a break in this year, last year there was only one that had a break, but most of them had a, had a history of PED. So again, we continue to go back to that risk factor, that regional risk factor, uh, areas that uh, I think we know where those are in the high dense uh, regions. Again, when we look at the data, 50% of them, they've never had a break. And the interesting thing is that very few of them have had more than one break. Again, when we measure time between breaks, there's 20% there's of them that if they break today, they're gonna be breaking again within a year. So look at the difference between this graph compared to the first graph in the sense that they, they, they're kind of more delayed. So that tells us we're kind of doing a better job at controlling it, perhaps eliminating it, but still we have 20% of those herds within the project that continue to have recurrent breaks of PED. Let's move on to and, and look at what have we learned recently. So even though we thought that PERS had a cyclical pattern that was a seasonal pattern. Well, we had uh, Dr. Andrea Ruda. She was a postdoc uh, with Dr. Bob Morrison. And she decided to look at, well, or she decided to challenge, is, it, is this really a seasonal pattern? Is this cyclical seasonal pattern? Well, it may not be it. Because when she looked at the aggregate data, it's pretty clear, but when she looked at it on a region basis, we can see that there's different 
patterns, right? So this is one comment that we have also been getting from the field, and is it might be good to have this graph every now and then so that people in those regions understand when is their high-risk season, right? However, this still, it's a good way of looking at it, just like uh, CDC looks at flu. They have a kind of a cyclical pattern, but still, I think if, I would like to know what's happening in my neighborhood, right? Another, another thing that we have learned really good, uh, or, or that a, a good thing that it has been good, is that she went ahead and looked at what is the best place to build a farm. If I were to build a south farm tomorrow, where should I locate it? Is there, should I take advantage of those environmental conditions or those physical conditions around me? Well, after they had a meeting with a producer, Bob and Andrea had a meeting with a producer, that question came up, and she said, well, let's go and look at land coverage, meaning trees, right? And then land slopes. So you, here you can see the Smoky Mountains, the Rocky Mountains in, in, in brown. And she said, well, let's look at how does this impact whether we have more or less purse outbreaks? And she could come to a conclusion that the steeper the hill or the more trees or shrubs around an area or a farm, the fewer the purse outbreaks. So that's something that we need to come up with and start integrating those conclusions into the field so that you can be in a better position at some point to prevent purse introductions. Again, <clears throat> Looking at network analysis, <clears throat> Gustavo Machado, who at that point was a, a postdoc with Andres Perez, he looked at PED from a network analysis standpoint and looking at risk. What happens if I move positive pigs into my neighborhood? Is that going to represent higher risk to my cell phone? Well, it is. So we know that this brings us back to our regional control, uh, area regional control programs, and that if we let positive pigs come into our region, well, we're going to increase our chances of uh, purse introduction or PED introduction into our cell herds. We're going to be looking at this from a purse standpoint. Even though we know it's PED applicable, well, let's look at purse, for, for instance. <clears throat> Other things that, we're, that are happening at the University of Minnesota, uh, biosecurity, that's always on our mind. That's always looking at developing technology so that you, they can be ap applicable on the, from a, a, at the field standpoint. And then Dr. Torre Moore, working with engineers, they have been developing and working really hard in looking at methods at, to try to characterize how those viruses are really penetrating those filters in those filters, filtered cell farms. There's also a model that is trying to estimate how those air leakages play, what, what role does those air, air leakages play in filtered cell farms? With that, I'm going to turn it to Juan Sangüesa, who's going to be talking about uh, first, first summer breaks and the uh, impact of time, time to stability, depending on when sow herds break during the season. Right. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity of being here. I'm going to start with this uh, presentation. So in, in this um, case, we are assessing the, the effect of uh, summer outbreaks and the time uh, to stability in using some of the uh, swine health monitoring project data that we have at the university. So in summer outbreaks, uh, we have a number of uh, participants that were concerned about, about them uh, during this summer 2017. So really the question that we asked at the beginning was, uh, was really a higher number of uh, summer cases during this summer uh, compared to previous years? And, and where, where do these uh, summer outbreaks uh, occur uh, geographically in, in the space? So as a data description, we, st we use the whole uh, uh, MSHMP database uh, in which we identify 1,329 PERS outbreaks in this uh, about nine years. And you can see there the distribution of uh, PERS outbreaks um, that we have in this database. Of course, this, is, this graph that you are seeing there is not corrected by the number of participants that have been, has been increasing during, the, during this uh, time. So this one uh, looks, uh, is, is a better picture in that sense that is adjusted for the increased number of participants. And, and you can see that there's years that we have a, a higher number of uh, 
cases, uh, proportion of cases compared to the population at risk, and years that you have a lower, a low, a lower proportion, but not really a, 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 not a very obvious trend. In, in this uh, database, uh, we identify around 180 uh, PERS outbreaks that occurred during the summer, and also 260 uh, PERS outbreaks that occurred during the spring. Together, they add up uh, up to around 35% of the cases. And still, most of them occur during autumn and, and winter months. So in the, in the temporal description of this data, uh, in, this, in this graph, this is the number of um, the proportion or the percentage of summer outbreaks compared to the population at risk in each of these years. So the number of participants, farms that we have in the data. And, and we cannot really see any kind of trend in the, in, in the proportion of summer breaks in, in throughout the years. It, it has remained at about uh, 3% um, in consistently throughout the years. When we observe what happened with other seasons, there is not really any obvious pattern for winter, perhaps, perhaps a higher number of uh, proportion of cases in the spring, but there has been um, a decreasing uh, trend uh, since the, the start of the project till now in the proportion of autumn cases. In 2017 hasn't finished yet, so we expect this uh, bar to go up a, a bit, but it still is, 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 a, is a decreasing trend during the years. Now, when we put these cases in a map, the, all the summer breaks that we have observed, uh, they look like this. So these are all, are all the cases that we have had uh, since 2009. And when we compare this with the population of controls, that will look like this. Uh, the population of controls in, in this, for this uh, example would be farms that broke in other seasons or uh, farms that didn't report it any, any breaks at all. We can, we can for example, for, with this data, instead of representing the points, we can build these uh, kernel densities to show the intensity in space of, of, of farms, how dense these areas are. And using these kernel densities, we can grab one, the cases, and divide it by the density in the controls to come up with this kind of risk surface that will act similar to a relative risk and which you will identify areas of a higher um, risk of summer breaks and areas of a lower a risk of, of having uh, summer breaks. We can also project this surface risk into a map and, and have a picture like this. We, uh, we, we, build, we build also these uh, contour lines, um, identifying areas where this uh, higher and lower risk are uh, significantly um, in, in, the, in the data. So red, red here is higher risk, and um, apologize that here is the, in the log scale, but this will be around 0.3, and this would be around 3, uh, 3 point something. Um, so this is, uh, these are areas where we observe farms having a higher risk of summer breaks, and, and, and these other areas where we observe um, uh, farms having a lower risk. And, 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 and here is just to show you how these points will look in this, in this map. So as a summary for, for this first part, um, we, we observed in this, in this investigation that 3% of uh, farms had a break during the summer, and we observed no evidence of um, any, any trend in, in summer breaks in, in the proportion of uh, farms breaking during the summer. But we did identify areas of high and low um, risk of breaking during the summer. Now, right. In the second, second part, um, we are going through the uh, time to stability. Uh, and we want to 
assess factors related to the time to stability in, 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 in a subset of farms. So we use uh, the, the time to stability defined as the time from uh, a pair's outbreak to having negative piglets at winning. And, and we use the classification, the standard classification for, uh, by Holtkamp and uh, basically is a herd with no clinical signs in the breeding herd and also uh, a minimum of four negative uh, PCR tests at winning uh, that were sampled at least every 30, year, 30 days. Sorry. So we, we had some anecdotal reports that it seemed harder for a, a producer to uh, achieve stability when the outbreak occurred during the summer. So we, the question here was, does it really, uh, def, uh, are we able to observe a, um, a different time to stability according to the season where, when the outbreak occurred? So we used data from six uh, participants that follow the guidelines, and, and we use uh, outbreaks that occur from March 2011 till March 2017. And as an outcome, we had the time to stability, the TTS, and we, and, and we use a bunch of uh, predictor variables in, for this analysis, being the one of interest, the outbreak, the outbreak season. And we analyzed this data using a survival analysis uh, technique, uh, using the Cox Proportional Hazard Model. model. And uh, we included farm ID and system as random effects to uh, account for the clustering that we had in this data. So in this subset of farms, we, we had 170 burst outbreaks events in 86 farms. And, and the median that we observed uh, was of two per eggs uh, per farm with a minimum, minimum of one and a maximum of five. The TTS that we observed in these uh, six participants was, had a median of 41.5 weeks, and which is, which is um, higher than uh, what uh, Daniel observed uh, some years ago. And, and this is a subset of participants. This is not the whole database. It's, we're only talking about six participants. When we, we, when we plot uh, the, the, the proportion of unstable farms uh, against time, we can see a decline, a steady decline in, 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 the, in the farms. So these are the farms achieving stability. And we get to the point of the median of 41.5 weeks, and then up to 30, uh, 74 weeks, which uh, this, is, this point is around 96% of the data. And then some farms that linger uh, had more trouble trying to achieve stability, and they linger till uh, 150, more than 150 weeks. When we uh, uh, try to assess uh, the difference between systems, we observe uh, significant differences uh, between the TTS in, in, in all these six participants, uh, being system A, B, and F, uh, having shorter time, time to stability than C, D, and F. And, and in the red line there will uh, represent the median time. Now, the distribution of breaks during the seasons, uh, we still have a, a dominance of breaks during autumn and winter, but uh, still a, a good number of uh, breaks occurring during spring and summer. And this graph will represent um, when, when each farm achieve stability. So most farm achieve stability between March and November, most in the summer month, and very few during, during winter month. Now, in the season, we observe that breaks that occur during winter and autumn had shorter TTS than the ones that occur during spring and summer. And this, and this difference in, in, in weeks, which is large, is statistically significant. And again, this is the, the again, the Kaplan-Meier curve stratified by um, the, the season of uh, when, when the PERS outbreak occurred. And this blue it will be winter and autumn is significantly different to spring and summer. 
and, and just this is the result of the the the, the final result of the model. Uh, I I don't want to overwhelm you, but it's, it's kind of to represent the same idea that winter and autumn month uh, have achieved are able to achieve a stability um, quicker than the outbreaks that occur during summer. Being the reference here, and we observe also a difference in hair size, but it's not it's not significant. It's a point point one as a p-value, and also uh, we observe that farms that were in a status uh, two FBI when they had the break uh, were able to achieve a stability uh, faster compared to the ones that were in a status uh, using vaccine virus. When, when the outbreak occurred. And so as a summary of this, of, of this second, second part, uh, we observed that farms that had outbreaks during the summer took significantly longer to achieve stability compared to the farms that uh, had an outbreak during winter or autumn. And I want to acknowledge the, all the uh, participants in this project and, and the ones that uh, provide the data and make, make this analysis possible and also the Swine Health Information Center for all the support. And now I th think I'll pass it to Carlos uh, for, for the second last part of this session. Thanks. Good morning. I would like to start um, by thanking UBI for um, having given us the opportunity to present our work here. So in, in this study, we look at different new strategies to sample the farm to detect the first virus. Well, um, during the last year, we have experienced an improvement in diagnostic techniques, and now we can find the virus like easily, and, and it requires less um, less money to find the virus, so we can, we can pull or we can use oral fluids. So it's, every time it's easier to find, well, we have improved those diagnostic techniques. But, however, there's still some opportunities that we can make those uh, diagnostics better. And one of the ways to do that would be like using um, cores or, or routinary um, work that is, is, is uh, done in the farm, or also using different techniques that have been used for other diseases as um, environmental sampling for PD. So the objectives, the goals of this study were to, well, to evaluate the use of the processing fluids um, as a diagnostic tool and the use of the environment as a diagnostic tool as well. So in the first part, we have different subcategories. We will test sensitivity and specificity of the processing fluids we will evaluate the effect of that pooling. We will look at the parity effect on the processing fluids, and also we will compare how the processing fluids are doing um, versus the, 30, the bleeding 30 piglets at, um, at winning. The study design, so this study started two weeks after an outbreak. This outbreak occurred in, in February, so the first sampling point was in March. And then we, we sampled um, eight weeks, separated three weeks from each other, and this study finished in July. So in, in March, at the end of March, it was a virus inoculation between, between the weeks uh, post top grade five and eight, and this farm was, was coming from a, a status three according to the ASB guidelines, so it was provisionally negative. We selected 10 liters. They, they were conveniently selected each, each of the weeks. And then we, in the processing, we collected the testicles and the tails. We put the, them in a Ziploc bag. We let the, the Ziploc bag um, sit there until we finished the collection of blood. And then we extracted the, the processing fluids. We extracted the fluids. We centrifuged them at the farm. And then we, we uh, brought them to the laboratory to do the PCR test. And also we were bleeding all the piglets in, that, in those liters. And we will use the serum as a gold standard to compare what is, 
what we can detect in, in the serum or in the blood and versus the processing fluids. So this is the results of, of this comparison between these um, 77 liters at the end and 939 piglets. So we can see that over time there's a decrease in the percentage of positive either animals or, or liters. We saw that we an increase an increase on, on the number of uh, liters after the virus inoculation, but this is not really reflected in the number or the percentage of positive piglets. So we, we have more piglets positive, but not uh, in, the same, in the same liter. Then also we see in the week post outbreak 11 that we were not able to detect the virus using the processing fluids, even though it was like a 2%, approximately 2% of the piglets positive. I have to say that this farm was not closed because it, um, it was going under a remodelation, so they, they couldn't close the farm. And we can see that this continuous leaf flow of uh, new gills was keeping the virus in the farm. So after almost uh, six months, we can see that we are still capable of finding the virus. If we compare what we are seeing in the litter, considering a, a litter that is positive, if at least had one positive piglet in, uh, at serum, that you can see here. And then you can, we look at the processing fluid status, positive or negative. We're seeing that the sensitivity is very high. It's 83% and the specificity is 92%. We use a a cut of value of, of um, a city cut of value of 37.5 in order to get rid of the suspect uh, samples. And we also saw that it was a, a good agreement between both techniques. That is the, what is the Kappa test telling us, it's a 0 0.76. If we look at the city values over time, being the orange ones, the serum, city values and the blue ones, the, the processing fluid um, city values, we're seeing that yeah, there's, there's an increase in the number of, of city values, meaning that there's less virus, but at the end, what we're seeing is a, a decrease. So meaning that those liters or piglets that were found positive there, they had higher viruses, higher concentration of viruses. Also, we can see the pooling effect of um, aggregating the processing fluids versus the serum. We can see that the city values of the processing fluids is a little bit, a little bit higher than, the, than the, mean, the average of the serum. But interestingly, at the last um, three weeks of sampling, this situation was, was reversed. Then we wanted to look at the that effect of the dilution, how much can we pull these, these samples, how many, how many liters we can put together and, and use that tool as a diagnostic and how much of this sensitivity we are losing. So what we did using those processing fluids, we divide them in three, in three categories uh, according to their city, city values. You can see the categories uh, in the right of, of the slide. And then uh, we diluted them like 10 times, 20 times, 30, 40, up to 50 times, trying to emulate what, what happened if we pull 50 liters. And, and what we are seeing is like the, the most of the loss of that sensitivity occur in the first dilution as uh, this is something that we are, were expecting. Is only we're losing a sensitivity of 20%, meaning that the CT values that we have in that point are 20% higher than the ones that we have in the, in the initial sample. And this is the most of the, the, the loss of the sensitivity because when we compare with the last point, we only lost 24% uh, as an average. If we use the same formula that creates these this, um, lines, we can, we can predict that we will reach negative values 
when we uh, have a positive sample of 32 city, city values there. So once we start, if we pull 50 liters, uh, once we start having negative, that means that probably then we should start looking at, at samples individually. In the second part of this study, we were expecting a low prevalence, um, a low prevalence in, the, in the last part of the study. So we decided to collect all processing fluids that were of the liters that were processed um, in, in those days of the sampling points. And then we ended having like 100 more processing fluids so we could evaluate, for example, the parity effect that I'm gonna talk about. So just to have a comparison between what we collected using all these, all these processing fluids versus the ones that we used in the, in the other study. So we're seeing more or less the same trend but now we were able to detect some positive um, liters in that, in that week, in the week uh, that we were missing before. We also saw an increase of, of the number of positive fluids uh, in week 14, and um, in the week 23, it seems that it decreased, but actually we were having a, like a better picture of what was happening in the following. So when we look at those processing fluids compared with the parity, what we're seeing is like there's a, there's a difference, a statistical difference between parities one and two when compared to the other parities, meaning that those parities, they have a, a higher proportion of positive animals. So this could happen because um, this farm was not closed, so we were entering, keep entering animals, keep entering gills, so those gills uh, were being infected. So that happened if we compare one and two as a group versus the rest of the parties, and even if we compare those separately, one versus the rest of the parties and two versus the rest of the parties. And this is the evolution of these different parties versus time. We, we're seeing that there's a, a decrease, so we have, we have parties in the y-axis, we have uh, time in the x-axis, and we're seeing that there's a decrease in the number of, of positive gills over time, of the positive processing fluids. Then, if we use those, those piglets that we have bled before and we compare them over time and, and, and we compare them by parity, we're seeing that gills or, or second parity sows they, they are the ones that they have the, the most of the number of positive piglets in the litter. So we, we're seeing that after parity number three, we are not able to see any litter with more than six positive piglets. In the last, in the last point of, of, this, um, of the processing fluids, we, we will compare that with what we are doing uh, at winning. So in that sense, we have the black line here is, is the percentage of positive animals in serum. Um, the red line is the percentage of, of uh, positive liters of positive processing fluids that we use collecting those 175 processing fluids. You see a, a dot line there. This is the limit of detection of the 30 piglets at winning. And then also you see those bars. Those bars represent one sample each, like one weekly sampling at, um, at winning. So the blue are the negative ones, the, red, the orange are the positive ones. And what we are seeing here is we are able to detect positive animals, so we, we can define better the status of the soil farm using the processing fluids, and we are missing, missing um, some viruses at winning. We are not able to detect those viruses at winning. We are only able to detect in only one of those samplings that one out of six pools were positive. As a, as a sum up for this part, while the processing fluids are an effective sample to detect this virus in, in piglets, including uh, after significant time since the outbreak especially in liters from young parity sows, and the limitation of these studies that was performed only in one farm. 
In the second part of the study, we were looking at the environment and the soil. The design is exactly the same. We were in the same farm um, sampling the same point, the same weeks. And in this case, we, we sampled the surface, uh, meaning that we use a, a wipe to, well, we use a gauze to wipe all the surfaces in the crate, in those crates that we were taking blood. Then we also, we wipe the other of the cell, the skin of the other of the cell. And then we were putting some tin foil around the, the room and uh, letting the dust sit there for an hour. And then we were wiping that, that tin foil as well. So if we compare that surface wipes versus the litter status again, like meaning that the litter status being positive or negative, if at least one piglet is positive, we're seeing that um, we're still able to, to detect some, some percentage of, of those litters. So in this case, the sensitivity is 50%, the specificity is 92%. The kappa, the, the agreement between both, both tests is moderate. And we're seeing the same with the other wipes. There's no, not, not that difference between the surface or the other wipes. If we look at the evolution over time of, of this type of technique, being the blue negative, the orange positive, the darker colors, the surface, um, the lighter colors, the other wipes, we're seeing that we are still able to detect the virus up to 17 weeks. And, and we are seeing that, that decrease in the percentage of, of positive samples. If we look at the ones at the airborne, that the ones that we're collecting using the team file, we're seeing that we are able to detect the virus in the soul, in the, in the farrowing room, up to 14 weeks after the outbreak. And this is a, a slide that wants to summarize what, uh, what we have talked, what we have uh, looked at. We're seeing different types of agreement, and uh, we try to sequence all the types of samples, and we were able to detect the virus in all, all the sampling. And then as a conclusion of this second part, well, environmental samples have lower sensitivity than the processing fluids. Virus can be found in the environment up to 14 weeks after the outbreaks, and then we were able to sequence all those types of samplings. And the processing fluids are a very sensitive sample, and the first, one of the first questions that we had is like if the, that fluid uh, was coming from the tails or was coming from the testicles because that could, you know, somehow bias the diagnostics towards, towards what was happening in the males. And, and we, we look at that and we saw that there's no noticeable fluid coming out of the tails. But even though that, um, in some cases we had only females that were positive and we were able to capture that using the processing fluids as a diagnostic sample, meaning that, you know, the, that fluid probably is doing some wash in the tails, and then we are able to extract the virus from there. And it was no difference between the number of, of positive uh, males and females. Then it's, it seems that like it's a good tool to define the, the, the hair status, the uh, virus status of the hair, being positive of, of negative. We did not increase sensitivity by increasing sample size, so we, we can we can target um, what we want if we want to detect the virus, and uh, we can target the young parity effects. This was described by uh, Jean Paul Cano thesis. And then pulling processing fluids from various liters may reduce the sensitivity at high CT values, as we saw. Like if we go um, above 32 CT values, then we will start like seeing negative. And some final take-home messages, like the use of processing fluids is a sensitive tool for sampling breeding herds. Pulling of processing fluids may reduce our sensitivity at higher cities. However, it will allow us to sample more liters. And we should target young parties for pierce virus sampling. We'd like to acknowledge all the people that help and, and with this study and all the agencies. And then I will handle to Caesar again. Thank you. Thank you, Juan and Carlos, for sharing some, so much exciting data. <clears throat> and just to wrap it up, let's, uh, let me share with you what's, uh, what's next uh, from the group at the University of Minnesota. So one of the things that we want to continue doing is trying to integrate 
as many findings as we can to try to solve the big problem. How do we go about looking at disease from a regional standpoint so that we can integrate diagnostics, surveillance, all the epidemiology, uh, important things that we have been finding so that we can go and prevent or control disease. So from, from, from a predicting standpoint, we're going to continue to be working on putting together, like I just said, all these database, the MSHIM database, big movements, spatial data, weather patterns, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can funnel all that into a software, visualize it, analyze it, and then we can try to predict. That's what Kim Vanderwall is going to be doing, or is actually doing already. We're also going to be looking at what people, what's the role of people with regards to introduction of disease. Is the turnover rate important or not? Are they really disciplined following uh, all these biosecurity measures or not? So that's one thing. Another thing is that we know that South Farms may be surrounded by finishing sites, and we continue to talk about, yeah, let's put all our uh, oral attention in filtering South Farms. Well, we also need to start shifting and looking at finishing sites. So Dr. Tomorrow and Jose Angul are going to be looking at that. Also, we're going to be looking at how can we try to avoid pathogens from escaping all these South Farms. How can we try to inactivate those pathogens that want to become airborne and stop them there so that they don't spread. Also, we also want to go and look at uh, what Carlos has been talking about, and is how can we go into that farming house and try to stop disease spread. So I think we're going to have to look at uh, the environment and how can we mitigate that spread. Also, we, we have a transport app in place that we're, gonna, we start, we're still trying to figure out a lot of uh, the IT part behind it, it's quite complex, but we're also going to try to figure out a way to integrate that data so that we can start contributing to risk prediction. So what's the impact of moving those positive pays? How can we trace that back with all this information generated by the transport app? We're also going to be looking at monitoring as well. So Kim Vanderwall, and I think she's going to be working with Daniel Linares on this, and they're going to start to monitor all these disease trends from a submission standpoint. So can we go ahead and say, well, the labs are starting to get more serum samples this week. They're going to go for purse testing. Can we try to see if this is going to be an early indicator of disease spread or not so that we can continue to add into this prediction? Also, like just Carlos mentioned, we know we have some really good diagnostic tests. We know we have some really good processes for sample collection, how can we optimize those in those very low uh, prevalence uh, scenarios when it comes to viral cl clearance from these sow herds? All this is with one vision, and is that at some point, and this is our vision towards 2020, is if we really want to have a good handle when it comes to regional and local health, we're going to have to have all these areas really well coordinated so that we can start pushing disease out or also keeping disease out. So, for example, if we want to if we want to keep this business continuity, which is also part of the uh, Safe Pork Supply program, we need to understand where are those hot spots, right? So, for example, we're going to have those hot and cold maps, just like. Uh, one show to you, where do we have those summer breaks? Where do we have those fall breaks? Not only from a PERS or PED standpoint, but also from an emerging pathogen standpoint. So if, a, if, a, if an emerging pathogen would come into the, far, uh, to the states, we would know right away where they are. But then we will also move that data to, from a, from a, to a transport part. Can we have a, like a map where we have a transport heat map? which roads are the ones that we have to avoid, so that at the end we, we start putting all those two together. And finally, when we start having all these uh, breaks, we need to get to the bottom of this, trying to understand what was the route for introduction. Even though some of these investigations are not very rewarding, I think the better we get at it, the closer we're going to get to this answer. With that, I want to acknowledge producers. They have been very good at sharing information. They're pretty open with us. Veterinarians have been a key part of that. I have to uh, acknowledge that as well. 
with the Amphishim participants, it has been a pleasure to work with them. You know, it's, it's amazing how open they are. And again, veterinarians have been a major, they have been a really important component for that willingness to participate. BI, so it is, they have been always been supporting the University of Minnesota. Even though I'm speaking here, there's a big team behind, uh, behind this that is uh, pushing towards uh, controlling and preventing disease. Collaborators, it has been a great honor to work with them. And I think the Swine Health Information System, with, that, with their mission, they continue to push this, as well as other supporting agencies. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Please don't forget to check out our blog and follow us on Twitter. And I think, I'm not sure if we're going to have questions right now, but I'll be happy to take any questions either right now or later. We're going to be around here today, so please come and see us if you have any burning questions. Thank you.